Who in here treats kidney stones? Who of you use a laser? So this is gonna be clinically applicable to your practice, I hope. Help you learn how to choose a laser and how to use it most efficiently. Uh, time really is money for us. Um, one important disclosure I have is that I am on the data safety monitoring board for burst wavelet tripsy, which I'm gonna talk a little bit about at the end. So why should we care about new technology for stone disease? Well, we all give medical and uh, dietary recommendations, but patients often don't follow it and, you know, stone disease in increases. Um, we're using flexible ureteroscopy more and more, and I'll show you data later on that. Um, and actually, our stone-free outcomes after ureteroscopy aren't so good. 60% if you use CT as your imaging. And there's also a recognition that residual fragments really are not um, insignificant. They lead to retreatment and stone-related events. So when we talk about laser lithotripsy, what is it that you as a clinician can control? You can control what laser you choose, what pulse energy you dial in in joules, what pulse frequency you dial in in hertz, and the pulse width. Um, that's available on some lasers, and we'll talk about that in depth. You can also um, de decide and control what your lithotripsy technique is going to be. Are you going to fragment and basket? Are you going to dust, or are you going to use some combination of, of the two? And I'll show you those um, in, in some videos here. All right, who in the, in the audience knows how your laser works? Okay, there's no quiz, I promise. <laughs> So the Holmium laser has been identified by the EAU guidelines as the preferred laser for flexible ureteroscopy. It is a solid state pulsed wave laser. How does it work? There's a high voltage energy that's coming from the wall. It is being pumped into this flash lamp um, and then that is being um, absorbed by a crystal that has holmium ions in it. Those are excited and then admitted out of the crystal into essentially emitted radiation. There are two reflective mirrors in your holmium laser that then excite and amplify that um, energy and then it's put through a beam essentially out of the laser box. And for holmium, that comes out at a wavelength of 24, I'm sorry, 2140 nanometers. This is strongly absorbed by water. This is why this is a good laser to use um, for laser lithotripsy. It's not only safe, but it's also effective. How does the laser break a stone? Well, it can work by two different mechanisms. It can work by a photothermal effect where you have direct uh, laser energy absorption, which causes a chemical decomposition and ablation of the stone. You can also have a thermomechanical effect um, where you have vaporization of water inside the stone itself, which leads to the stone really like bursting from the inside. Well, there are two major considerations in holmium laser lithotripsy. You want efficiency of fragmentation, you want to reduce retropulsion so that every pulse is hitting the stone as effectively as possible. We talked about the things you can control. When we talk about wattage, how much total energy are you giving, it is a multiplication of the frequency and the energy. Um, and that's why I say it's a 100 watt laser, or it's a 50 watt laser, or I used 10 watts for this case. Um, that's what you're referring to. So those two things we can control on our laser. There, is now, there are now lasers that allow us to also control the pulse width. That's how long is the pulse active, the duration of the pulse. The first generation systems only had short pulse, so 350 microseconds. Newer systems have both medium and long pulse settings, and I'll show you why that might actually be helpful. So why would we care about pulse width? Well, these um, in vitro studies by Dr. Traxair's group have shown that when you use uh, long pulse, you have less retropulsion, which we said is better, um, and less fiber tip degradation, so your fiber is going to last longer. Let's talk about this comparison. So here I'm showing you short pulse width at 2 joules and 50 hertz. So you're seeing that this, the stone sort of fragments really well, but gosh, it's moving all over the place. Okay, So that's short pulse. In comparison, here's long pulse. See how the stone just kind of sits there? It's hardly moving, and so every, sh every pulse that we're giving to the stone is, is able to actually um, hit the stone effectively. Now, it doesn't break the stone as well, so you might be thinking in your head already, well, gosh, you know, one might be really good for fragmentation and one might be really good for uh, dusting, and that's exactly what I'm going to show you. So how do you dial this in? This is a P120 luminous laser. I'm showing you this because it's what I use in my operating room. There, you can see on the screen exactly where you would dial in the pulse width. 
Okay, so what are we trying to achieve? Now, we're we talked about what you control in your laser. What can you control when you use the laser? What techniques can you use? So you can choose to do dusting, where your goal is to create little tiny sand, um, or you can choose to do fragmentation, where you're trying to make pieces that you can actually remove with a basket. So the settings that we recommend for the two are different. If you are trying to dust a stone, you want low energy, 0 0.2 to 0 0.5 joules and high frequency, 40 to 80 hertz. You might say to yourself, well, my laser doesn't do that. Yep, you need a higher watt laser to be able to get to achieve those higher frequencies. And as I showed you before, you want long pulse, okay? What you're doing is you're painting the stone from the outside in and trying to make pieces that you don't have to extract, okay? Fragmentation with extraction is different. You want to use high energy, one to two joules, and you want to use low frequency, six to 10 hertz. And short pulse, again, every, if you're trying to break the stone, you really into pieces, you want each pulse to be short and to be powerful. So these newer high powered lasers, they have a two pedal phenomenon. So you can actually set one pedal at dusting and one pedal at fragmentation. If you forget everything I just said, they come with preset values in them. So you can just say to your laser technician, put dusting on or put fragmentation on. So we talked about how we could use the laser in a contact mode for dusting or, or basketing and fragmentation. What if we were to use it in a non-contact way? This is what we call popcorning or pop dusting. Here you are using the laser and firing it <clears throat> in the middle of a calyx so that the stone fragments are moving around. It's thought that it's collapsive cavitation bubbles that are causing the movement, although it's not completely understood. But the idea is that um, you know, it's hitting every time you're firing the laser continuously, those pieces are moving around and hitting the tip of the, of the laser fiber. So you're getting smaller and smaller fragments. For pop dusting or popcorning, called that because it looks like popcorn moving around a machine, um, you use moderate energy, 1 to 1.5 joules and moderate frequency, 10 to 15 hertz. So you might be sitting there thinking, gosh, that's <clears throat> a lot of energy. Do we have to worry about temperature? Uh, this is a very interesting porcine study, which looked at uh, using 0.5 and 80 hertz at short pulse um, and looked at thermal injury. And when you vary the irrigation, whether or not <clears throat> that would have any impact um, on the thermal injury itself. And as you can see, when you have no irrigation running and you're doing, running the laser, in the red line, you're going to have a significant rise um, in temperature and takes 12 seconds to see thermal injury. Whereas if you use the pressure um, at 150 um, millimeters of mercury, you will see no injury. Uh, so the take home message here is, if you're gonna be using higher power settings, you need good irrigation, okay? Okay, so <clears throat> there are limitations to the Holmium laser. It's highly absorbed by water, but that then limits the energy transmission to the stone. The Moses effect was described in 1986 in the setting of endovascular um, ablation, tissue ablation, actually. All it refers to is the, the uh, creation of a vapor bubble at the tip of the laser fiber when, it is, um, when it's firing, and then the laser pulse is going to go through that. <clears throat> that is, Moses effect is different than Moses technology. Moses technology it is actually modulating the laser pulse so that you use the benefit of the Moses effect. You're gonna give an initiation pulse, a small initiation pulse, which is gonna push the fluid aside to allow the, 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 the second pulse to move through it and get more energy to the stone itself. So this is really a, a, a fairly new technique um, in uh, laser technology that's pretty exciting. So, this does require a high power 120, uh, P120 laser. You can use the Moses in contact mode at zero to one millimeters from the stone or in distance mode, two millimeters. So say you're up in the kidney and there's a stone, you just can't quite get your, your laser fiber onto it. You can be two millimeters away and still be treating the stone. What are the perceived uh, benefits of Moses technology? Well, it's predominantly been studied in vitro. Um, in vitro studies have shown that you could have reduced retropulsion, which we said is good, uh, a, a decrease of at least 60%. 
And in this study by Dr. Andonian's group, uh, they were able to show at both dusting and fragmentation settings that the stone ablation was higher when you used Moses, and that's represented here in the orange bars. In the few clinical studies that exist, the Moses has been shown to have shorter time uh, operative time in fragmentation mode, uh, six minutes versus 10 minutes, and in the only randomized controlled trial so far, which has been published only in abstract form, it was shown to have uh, reduced fragmentation and procedure time. So here's a side-by-side -side comparison. This is Moses off on your left screen and Moses on on the right. I think you can see stone really moves a lot less um, in, when the Moses is being used. So I told you short pulse. The disadvantage of short pulse is lots of retropulsion. The disadvantage of long pulse is not as efficient. So Moses is trying to combine the two and give you less retropulsion as well as good efficiency. So that's why it's fairly exciting. How do you dial that in on your laser? Well, there it is. It has another uh, place where you can just next to where the pulse width is. Um, I'm a, a member of the Endourology Disease Group for Excellence, the EDGE group, and will be the PI for this study, where we're actually doing a prospective randomized double-blind clinical trial to compare MOSES to non-MOSES. Um, but we just started uh, enrolling, so don't have data for you yet. Okay, so who has heard of the Tholium fiber laser? Okay, so this is pretty exciting. This is like, not a lot has happened in laser technology that's been super uh, different. It's been advancements on what we already knew, but the thulium fiber laser really is different. So instead of using a flash lamp, now you're using a diode laser, so that can use a standard electrical plug. It's gonna pump into these thulium uh, doped silica fibers, have really thin core, and then coupled to a regular silicone laser fiber like you would use a silica coated laser fiber. And the idea is that you're going to uh, have a, 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 a laser wavelength of about 1940, which actually uh, is perfectly uh, matches the absorption peak um, of, of water. Um, and so it's actually thought, to, thought that it might be, be much more efficient. It also gives you a more focused spatial beam profile. Why, why is that helpful? You can use a much smaller laser fiber. Um, so this could be pretty um, important. Uh, it comes in a 50 to 55 watt laser, so, so lower power laser, and has significant variability in pulse length. Clinical studies are in progress, but I want you to understand, I showed you what you can do with the Holmium laser. The variability in settings is ex extensive with the thulium fiber laser. Pulse energies can be dialed in from 0 0.025 to 6 joules. Pulse frequencies could go from 5 to 2200 hertz. Um, pulse width from 200 to 12,000 microseconds. And as I said, you can use small, more flexible fibers. Um, so they've shown that you can go down to, to a 50 micron fiber. I think when it comes to the US market here, it'll be the smallest fiber would be 150, but still a smaller fiber in your working channel means better irrigation, potentially better uh, visibility. It also is small and compact. It's cooled by a fan system, so um, you don't need a big liquid cooling tank like you'll see in those big P120 lasers. And it can be plugged into a 110 volt outlet, just like you have in all of your operating rooms, whereas the higher watt uh, Holmium laser requires a special uh, plug that needs to be installed. So what about the comparison of Holmium versus Tholium? Um, well, this is really a compilation of clinical studies that uh, Dr. Tra Traxair's group put together in an illustration, but they were able to show in comparing um, Holmium versus Tholium that the Tholium laser fiber had four times more ablation than the Holmium and created much smaller dust particles. Again, if the idea is dusting and you don't want to be basketing and you want to really be done faster, you want the smallest uh, pieces possible. In addition, they felt that the data supported less retropulsion, and this is the thulium fiber laser being used. Um, <clears throat> we can talk about this hopefully in the uh, critique panel, but I think to some degree how well a stone dusts has a lot to do with its composition. Um, and so this, uh, in this video, I think the stone looks fairly soft, so maybe it would dust well with anything. I think you have to take that into consideration when we think about um, watching these lasers in action. So as I said, it's in pre-market evaluation here in the United States. Um, in the late spring, it'll be available. Um, and it'll be called the Soltive and marketed by Olympus, um, if you're interested. So what's on the horizon? 
This is an interesting um, paper I just read um, about a novel laser lithotripsy system um, that will actually monitor autofluorescence spectra from the laser while you're using it. And it will only allow the laser to fiber if you are in contact with the stone, so in range, and not on the tissue. So think about self-driving cars and all of these things. Now you can have a laser that can actually think for itself. So that's uh, pretty interesting. Um, this is not related to laser lithotripsy, but I wanted you to know about burst wave lithotripsy because uh, I think it's really a fascinating idea. It's uh, only, it's in, it just enrolled its first uh, human subjects. Uh, prior to this, all have been um, preclinical data. But burst wave lithotripsy is applying focused bursts of ultrasound through the flank of the patient to try to break stones inside the patient. Um, in a porcine study, they were able to show that 80% of the stone mass was able to be uh, reduced to fragments less than two millimeters. Um, so I want to show you what this looks like. So this is an in vitro study. This is the ultrasound pulses coming through. You can see the tiny little dust that we're getting. Can't, I would say that's better than some of the laser stuff I've shown you. And here it is inside. Uh, this is in, in a pig model. But you can see, again, you know, the stone's moving and it's breaking up. So this may be a really something you could do in the office. This is done really with no anesthesia. So in conclusion, um, I think you know, the effectiveness of our laser clearly is um, you know, driven by both the stone and the patient factors. But if you understand how best to use your laser, what you can change, and what techniques to use, I think you can improve laser lithotripsy. And as we said, time is money. So I'm really excited about these advances in laser technology. If there's anyone that has additional questions, please feel free to, to find me at the break, and I'll uh, share anything that I know with you. And I thank you all so much for your time.